I work in Northwest Minnesota. My colleague, Mary Bauer, is also here. She is in our Metro office. Uh, I was asked just to share a couple of the things that our division provides for people who are um, deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing, and late deafened. Our division's primary focus is communication access, but we know that communication access really impacts every facet of a person's life. Our services are primarily consumer driven. So a person who has really any degree of hearing loss, who uses really any kind of communication can contact us. We will sit and consult with you whatever your need is, we can talk with you about what that need is. Um, it might be assistive technology and we can kind of talk with you about what types of technology are available. If you're looking for financial resources, we can talk with you about what financial resources might be available. If your experience is barriers to communication access, we can walk you through ways to advocate for yourself in a setting like healthcare, for example, you've requested an assistive listening device or CART, and you've been denied that request, we can talk with you about how to go forward in advocating for that access, or we can advocate right alongside you to make sure that you have communication access. We also have a variety of grants in the community that provide um, services for people who are deafblind or who have hearing loss and vision loss. We have grants that provide captioning. We have grants in um, the work at providing and increasing the capacity of interpreters for people who are deaf, deafblind, and also who have low vision and hearing loss. We've got just a wide variety of grants. We have a mental health program that provides mental health services for people um, at no cost who have hearing loss. And Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services also houses the telephone equipment distribution program, which in my opinion is one of the um, hidden gems in the state of Minnesota. It's got incredibly um, generous income guidelines, I almost would qualify for the program and you can get amplified telephone equipment at no cost if you qualify for that program. So we definitely have a lot to offer you if you have hearing loss and you've got questions, you need to talk something over, you're experiencing communication barriers, if you um, need to cope or adjust to hearing loss, give us a call because that's what we're here for to help you out. Thank you so much, Jeannie, with DHHSD. Before we begin, I want to remind our panelists to introduce yourselves. Uh, and I forgot as well. So also do a visual description. So for example, me, I'm a white woman with blonde hair pulled back. I'm wearing a brown shirt with a black background that will help our audience members who may have uh, vision loss be able to understand what's going on. So now I'm excited to introduce our hard of hearing facilitators, Andrea Reif and Keenan Go. And they will introduce themselves and then we will get on with our panel. So I'm gonna spotlight Andrea. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Andrea Reif. Um, I am a white woman with curly brown hair and I am wearing a black t-shirt and sitting in front of a kind of grayish wall. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just started with the commission in March, and my role there is um, as a hard of hearing specialist. Hi, everyone. My name is Kunan Gao. I am a Chinese woman with 
uh, shoulder length black hair. I'm wearing a blue shirt with white polka dots. My background behind me is a white and brown gridded Japanese broom divider. My role is as a civic engagement and outreach specialist, and I've been with the commission since last year. Thank you. Great, thank you. One person uh, asked a question. Uh, what is the Minnesota Commission? So Minnesota Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. It is uh, in downtown St. Paul in the Twin Cities metro area of Minnesota. And is it a, it is a state agency? So thank you for the question. I will now turn it over to Keenan, who will then explain the ground rules. Thank you. So the most important thing here is that we really want to respect the fact that we have a spotlight function. And also, so what that means is when you are ready to respond, please raise your hand with this raise hand zoom function, or you can physically raise your hand, wait for Andrea or I to call on you, and then wait for Jocelyn to spotlight you so that you can be up on the screen and ready. When you're ready to go ahead and speak, please say that say your name. For example, this is Keenan, this is Andrea, this is Sean, and so on. This allows our low vision and um, blind audience members to know who is speaking and also for the caption to be able to refer back to who is speaking. You can send questions through to me or to everyone in the chat function. I will collect all of them in, in a document. If there is time permitting, we'll pick a question from the audience to answer, but otherwise we will send them to all of the panelists and they can put together responses and we'll post them on the on our website. This panel will also be recorded. I will now turn it over to Andrea to introduce all of the panelists. Okay, this is Andrea speaking. Um, we'll start with um, just the first question of a brief introduction of yourself. We'll do a, ask you to do a visual description, your name, how you identify, deaf, hard of hearing, um, where you're currently working, and what caused your hearing loss, and age of onset if you're comfortable sharing that. So I'll have um, Sean go first. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sean Reif. I go by he, him. Um, I'm a white male. I'm standing in my office. There are two Star Wars posters behind me and I'm wearing a maroon shirt, t-shirt. Um, I identify uh, as hard of hearing, and I'm currently employed with the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans, and I am the Director of Development. I'm a professional fundraiser, and what we do is we work with uh, veterans that have served in the military that um, have experiencing or exiting homelessness. And what caused my hearing loss is uh, my time that I served in the military. I was in the military for 25 years, and I was an engineer and uh, was a lot of, around a lot of explosions. So I have high frequency noise induced hearing loss. And I was started in my late 30s. And by the time I got out in my late 40s, um, I was lucky enough to qualify for a disability through the VA and um, provide me with hearing aids. Thank you. So next I'll ask Monique to share. Hello, I am Monique Hammond and uh, my pronouns are she, hers and her. And uh, I identify as being hard of hearing. Now I am a white woman with medium length brown hair and full bangs. I wear wire rim glasses and a dark blue t-shirt with a white bead necklace. And I listen through headphones to this conversation. Now, by profession, I'm a hospital pharmacist, and although I'm still fully licensed to practice, I have not been active in my profession for quite some time, as hearing loss put me into an early and unexpected retirement. 
And so most of my time I spent nowadays and I have for years working on behalf of people who are hard of hearing. And so that is now my mission and my passion. And so I, I do presentations, I advocate, whatever you want me to be, I will be that for the people who are hard of hearing. Now, um, in my mid fifties, I came down with a sudden, uh, what the doctors called it catastrophic hearing loss. I went deaf in my left ear in a matter of four hours and life changed right there. And so, even though we never know really what the cause might be for these sudden events, I can tell you that they do change lives, but they also give new missions in life. And so that mission brings me here to you today. Thank you, Monique. Next, we'll hear from Jen Edwards. <clears throat> You're on mute. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Using two different devices here. Um, good evening. My name is Jennifer Edwards, but people do call me Jen. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman. I would like to tell you I have all brown hair, but it is mostly gray at this point. Um, and it's just past my shoulders. I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm sitting in my little home office corner. Behind me is all of my husband's Marvel and DC comic stuff that hangs around in our basement. Um, I work at US Bank in public finance. I manage a team of 12 people um, from three different states and um, we work together to um, ensure compliance obligations on, um, for issuers of corporate and municipal bonds. I identify as hard of hearing. My hearing loss is hereditary. It affects my father, my brother, myself, and my daughter. We have what is called BOR syndrome, which is branchio-otorenal syndrome, which is a disorder that causes issues in the development of the tissues in the neck. And then that also can lead to malformations in both the ears and the kidneys. I was born with it. Um, but it wasn't diagnosed until I was nearly four. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, next is Mark Zangara. There we go. Good evening, I'm Mark Zangara. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I am a white male with weaning gray hair. I'm sitting in front of a burgundy set of curtains with a blue shirt on. Um, I recently identified myself as hard of hearing. Um, I'm an American Sign Language teacher at Prior Lake High School. Um, I lost my hearing about five years ago. So I was, a, I was 56. Um, I was having problems with the phone in my classroom. I kept yanking the volume up. And one day I switched from my left ear to my right ear and I went, uh-oh, I can hear. Made an appointment with the audiologist and diagnosed with sudden hearing loss, maybe Meniere's. They're playing with that, but really my understanding is the treatment doesn't differ. Um, I've in the past three years, I've lost 10 decibels per year. So now I'm currently in the moderate to severe range with most of the, um, the speech sounds being gone. The left ear is muddled, the right ear is kind of clear. Um, so I depend on hearing aids, which are great. Um, helps me get through with hearing people. Thank you, Mark. Um, our last panelist is Sophia Barr. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be signing tonight. Uh, my office is a bit noisy, so sorry about that. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman. I have long brown hair. 
I'm currently wearing glasses and I'm wearing a black shirt with a gray sweater. I work two jobs. First one is the during the morning, uh, Minnesota Hands and Voices. I have two roles with them. I work in, as an admin assistant. And so I do like social media advertisements. And uh, my second role with them is a deaf and hard of hearing liaison. So I work with families who have kids who have a hearing loss. And so I meet with them and share my experience as a deaf hard of hearing person. My second job in the evenings, I work at a factory uh, and it's a pretty relaxed it, job. I just do a lot of paperwork and uh, the machines uh, make a lot of noise. So um, I used to identify as hard of hearing, but my hearing loss has become more severe. So now I have identified as being deaf. I was diagnosed when I was three. I, I was born really before they passed the law to do any type of hearing test with babies. So we didn't know what caused any reason. I don't have any history in my family of hearing loss. So we still don't really even know the cause. Thank you, Sophia. <clears throat> so the next question we have is, um, what accommodations do you use personally or in the workplace? Um, and I'm kind of excited to hear the, your answers on this because we have a lot of you with very different types of jobs and very different hearing losses. So I'm, I'm excited to hear um, your experiences here. Uh, we'll go in the same order that we did before. So we'll start um, again with Sean. And Andrea, we're gonna switch here. Okay. Thank you, this is Sean. Um, so my hearing loss isn't severe. And so I'll be pretty quick. The accommodations that I use personally are my hearing aids. I also have hearing aids that are um, Bluetooth connected and I have connected them to pretty much everything, my work computer, my phone, my tablets. Um, and at work, I tend to, we use Microsoft Teams as our primary um, communication tool. So I'm a pretty big advocate for internally in our agency to, to be captioning and turning on what they call uh, live transcription. They don't have officially use uh, captioning, um, which is something that Microsoft has chosen not to do. Um, and then we do a lot of uh, recaptioning of all our products after we've recorded or produced them for um, our general audience. And then in the, in the, at home, um, I'm a big proponent and user of, of uh, closed caption on my TV. And I love using closed caption goggles when I'm out at the movie theater. And, and I really, that's probably the only things I use right now. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, I can hear you downstairs. Um, <laughs> the next person I have is Monique. You're on mute, Monique. I mute myself. I usually am never on mute in my life. <laughs> So anyway, I'm using in uh, at home and then also in the community, when I go out, I'm mostly hearing aid assisted. I also would love to use my telecoils a lot more if we had more loops, but that's a totally different problem. At home, I also use the closed captioning on the television. But one of the things that has helped me the most of anything uh, ever since I came down with this hearing loss and I thought that I could not live in that world because it was so terribly noisy and I, uh, I, I, I just thought I wasn't going to be able to manage. And those are these, the noise reducing headphones. Oh, man, they, are, they have been so good for me because they help me focus totally, uh, uh, totally on the uh, the sound and on the speech ahead of me. And so they decrease my listening fatigue, they decrease anxiety, and they also help me do what we call in, the, in our uh, world, active listening. I have become in that way a better listener. And I think anybody who, who is hard of hearing should look into that kind of technique and actually practice it more. 
but the uh, but the uh, noise induced uh, but the uh, uh, the hearing listeners here my noise reduced uh, hearing listeners they help me sort of like here in stereo and i know that's really weird but that's what i am using and wherever i go they go thank you um next here from jen hello this is jen um in my personal life i do use hearing aids I use uh, Bluetooth streaming for pretty much every electronic device that there is um, for phone, tablet, and TV use. Um, I find that I do not and cannot watch TV or movies at home without subtitles or closed captioning. Um, when I'm really struggling to um, understand something out in the community, whether it be in a store or wherever, I will sometimes pull out my phone and use a, a quick captioning app, um, something like Deaf Note or something like that, um, that kind of transcribes the speech into text for me. Um, at work, I do enjoy the use of Bluetooth connectivity to my laptop and my work phone to use with my hearing aids. Um, it is a struggle, um, but trying to keep up with it. Um, we too have transitioned from WebEx over to Microsoft Teams in my workplace. So I do uh, use the live captions on Microsoft Teams. Um, with the remote work environment that many of us are experiencing nowadays, um, we lost a lot of face-to-face -face communication. So I never ever hesitate on a team call to ask my coworkers to please turn on their cameras so that I can get those visual cues and be able to do lip reading, particularly when there are um, quiet individuals or noisy environments or heavy accents that I have trouble with um, and that the live captions don't really translate very well. Um, we do a lot of online required training in my industry. Um, so I use captions and if they are not available, I will ask for transcripts and use those. Um, out in the community, I have taken advantage of open caption nights at some theaters such as the Orpheum. Orf I do use the captioning devices at the movie theaters. I, I feel like those big goggles are a little clunky and, and weird to wear, but I do, I, I do enjoy using those. Um, if I'm going out to a restaurant or something with a family member or friend, I will ask to be seated in a quieter area of the restaurant. Sometimes I have had to ask restaurants to turn down their music. Um, and then if I'm going out at an event where maybe there's a speaker or something like that, I will um, sit as close to them as possible and have found myself in situations where I'm either asking for a folding chair to put somewhere if the seats are full or just asking someone if they'd mind trading uh, for a different seat. So whatever I can do. Thank you, Jen. Um, next is Mark. Hi, this is Mark. Um, I currently wear bilateral hearing aids and I just got them tweaked today. Um, my left ear has a discrimination of only 18%. Found out I qualify for a cochlear implant. Um, so what the audiologist did is because it's clear on the right and fuzzy on the left, whatever I hear in the left hearing aid gets thrown over to the right side. So I hear everything kind of surround sound and it's like really eerie because I hear things now. Um, like Jen and Sean, I Bluetooth everything. Um, anytime I leave the house, I put my hearing aids on. Anytime I come in the house, I take the hearing aids off. Um, we sign at home all the time. When typically if we go out to a restaurant or something, we're always hanging around with people who sign. So, you know, the hearing aids are kind of there, but I depend on sign language when we're out and about in a noisy environment. Um, at school, the first two weeks are the hardest for me because we do a lot of talking and interacting in class. I teach level one ASL, so they know nothing. 
Um, so after about the first two weeks, we trans we transition into voice off signing, miming, trying to get things across. So things start to get a whole lot easier uh, in the classroom. Thanks, Mark. Um, our last uh, panelist is Sophia. This is Sophia. For me, here in home, I use a hearing aid on my left ear. We're found deaf on my right. But same with others that I use a Bluetooth and I connect phones and I connect my television, everything. I have captioning when I watch movies, I watch YouTube and other things that I enjoy as well. At work, I work remotely in my home for my morning job. And I use Teams for any of the meetings we have. I also use the live captioning. Almost everyone luckily in my team knows a little bit of sign language so that it's a bit helpful. Sometimes when I go into the office though, I have my personal work video phone where I'm able to make phone calls there. I'm, the building is already has the system ready to go for fire alarms with flashing lights and the like. My factory job, because I work late evenings, most of the higher, higher ups are already out at that time when I arrive to work. But if it's a last minute meeting, we typically use a special microphone that is connected to a caption device and auto caption option. So where we have maybe, maybe much last minute meetings, we use that specific microphone that will then translate to everything that they're saying. So I know what's happening in our factory. For personally, in my personal life, I typically request an ASL interpreter when I go out for any concerts or shows, for any type of musicals as well. Open captioning as well too. I request that if they don't have it, if there's not an interpreter available. All right, um, I'm going to turn it over to Keenan for a couple of questions and then you'll see me again in a few minutes. Uh, it was really helpful to hear what everyone's different and varied accommodations were. We saw a lot of like similarities. People use Microsoft Teams, like captioning, Bluetooth. And so the second question is an opportunity for you to share an experience well, one of two things. You can share an experience where you have to advocate for access and accommodations, or you can take the time to expand on a work barrier with hearing loss. And if you like, tie that back to your first answer. We will start with Sean. Hi, this is Sean. So as far as workplace barriers, I don't, I don't have a lot. Um, day to day and I'm pretty open about my hearing loss within my uh, work environment and the people I work with so I have no problem walking in a room and telling people I have hearing aids or just lean forward and I'll show my hearing aid and tell people to speak up. Um, one experience I had recently though is I'm a member of a VFW club and um, the, the Minnesota Deaf Hard Hearing Commission has, has um, put out a uh, a request to have people, you know, have always captioning on. And so we brought it up to our board and committee to leave our captions on because at the at any VFW you go to in the state of Minnesota, you'll have 90% of the veterans will have severe hearing loss. Um, so it seemed like a no-brainer that we would be able to lead the way in this. And we came across quite a bit of, of um, pushback from our members because they thought it would... Um, it, it would make our public guests that come in um, upset because there'd be captions on the TVs and they wouldn't be able to see the sports. Um, the 
they did try. And so we have made a policy that anytime they come in in the morning, they turn all the captions on all the TV, TVs. If a patron comes in and says, we'd like to turn it off, and it only happens during golf because captioning goes over the putt, I don't watch golf. I don't care. But they turn it off usually for those. Um, but for the rest of the day, uh, we're, we're trying our best. And it's, and it's really interesting how some people that even have severe hearing loss, and I see it every day with them, tend to tend to still gravitate towards you know they don't want accommodation for themselves because it might get in the way of somebody else's access to just a golfing golf, golf event so um, it's one of the challenges that I had to work with. Thank you John it's really unfortunate that sometimes we have to sometimes give space to people's preferences as opposed to like our own like need for accessibility. Um, next, we will turn it over to Mani to share. You are muted. There we go. So anyway, this is Monique. And my barrier at work was definitely background noise. And I never realized that when I was still hearing really well, I didn't realize that that was so disturbing. It wasn't loud, but it was a blend of sounds that was constant. And so it became like a grinding on me. And this became very tiring. And then you add on that the listening fatigue that comes with trying to focus, to hear, to interpret what, you're, what you think you hear. And so all of a sudden, one factor aggravated the other one. And on top of that, I had a workplace that was also very fast paced. And so there was frankly no way to accommodate my communication struggles in that department. And so one way that I felt that I could advocate for myself was to tell them what I actually could do. And so I offered to take over some of the jobs and assignments that actually needed attention and that were pretty important, but that never had been assigned to anybody permanently. However, all of my efforts kind of went uh, to zero because my company had no um, responsibility in causing me that hearing loss. And so then one always comes into this thing of willingness. However, I was telling them this and they turned me down because it was an unmanageable challenge for the human resource department to create a job totally for me to, to create a new position. And so at that point in time, I was in no condition to fight anymore. And I decided that there had to be something else that I would be able to do with myself and for myself. And so I just kind of let it go. But I can always look at myself and say, you know, I really gave it a good try. Sometimes that's where it stops. Thank you for saying, Monique. You would think that it wouldn't be that hard to turn off the background music. It was not. It was not music. These were people talking. There were eight telephones. I I counted them up. There were eight telephones in my department that sometimes all rang at once. It was not music, but it was also machines were uh, running because in a hospital pharmacy, you have HEPA filters going, you have mixing machines going, you have also people talking, you know, maybe to somebody at the window giving instructions. And so that was the noise. But when I heard well, I was able to sort that all out because that's what hearing does. And when I had the hearing loss, I lived in a world that was just totally incompatible. I felt almost with life, it was just so stressful. Thank you so much for clarifying. And thank you for sharing. Next, we will turn it over to Jen. Hello, this is Jen. Did I get myself unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I I want to share um, before I kind of go into the work barriers. Um, I grew up in a small town and um, having hearing loss in a small town back in the late 70s through the 80s um, was a difficult thing. 
Um, I struggled a lot because um, teachers at the time kind of equated hearing loss to a learning issue um, or an attention issue. I was often told, you need to try harder to hear. Um, you need to, um, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not applying yourself. You know, you need to do better um, when, it, when it was truly out of my control. And so one of the things that they would do is almost in a, a belittling tone say, well, I know you, Johnny, want to have this desk up in the front of the classroom, but Jennifer has to have it because she can't hear. So I, I took on a lot of sort of frustration and um, just became very irritated and felt really kind of put down and uh, demeaned because of that. And I, I've taken a little bit of that into my adult life as much as I try not to when I'm in the workplace. Um, I have to sometimes explain and, and be very upfront about my hearing loss. Um, and it gets very, very exhausting because I always have that fear in the back of my head of I'm going to be judged. I'm not going to get a promotion. I'm not going to get the next presentation. Um, so I always am like, should I really say anything? Um, but I get frustrated at the little things like, um, explaining that my hearing loss isn't just about volume. Screaming at me or, or speaking louder isn't going to help. It sometimes is a clarity issue. So no matter how much you tell me to turn up my phone or turn up my hearing aids, that doesn't necessarily help. Um, equipment and technology is a very big issue for me. And part of that is, is, is my own doing because of um, my resistance to, in my younger days, to have people see and be aware of my hearing loss, I chose to go many years with no hearing aids. And I didn't become really, really an active user of them until I needed to set an example for my daughter who needs them. Um, so I don't always know the best equipment to use or the things to do on my phone or on my computer or whatever to make it work for me. And um, the big struggle is once I finally get it right, such as what I'm dealing with right now is I, we switched from physical desk phones to soft phones on the computer. Your laptop goes from an older model to a refreshed version. Now you don't have the software that goes to your hearing aids. You no longer have a desk phone to pick up. So now your computer is basically... Um, so it's things like that that are my barrier in the workplace. It's just understanding what's available to me, putting it to good use, and finding a resource in a company that's very, very much willing to accommodate, but is so large it's hard to find the person or the one group of people that can help you. Um, so that's kind of where it comes down to me is uh, technology and just getting over my, my past experiences and understanding that um, the newer people in my life and in my job aren't deserving of that, uh, what I carry from my past. Thank you. Thank you. It really is. Thank you for sharing, Jen. It really is very emotional disaster and always having to advocate, not just advocate, but also educate people. And you always have to make a choice. You know, do you want to take that time to educate someone or just save your energy for another time? Thank you for sharing, Jen. Next, we will go to Sophia, uh, sorry, to Mark. Hi, this is Mark. Um, at school, we have a cluster of six rooms, we call it a pod. And during class change, all the teachers are standing out there and we're talking. All my pod mates understand they need to look at me. They take down their masks so I can understand. But the comical part comes in when a student tries to approach me from behind. And I don't go by Mr. Zangara, I go by Mark in my classroom. Um, and they'll go, Mark, Mark. And the science teacher Tyler look and go, he can't hear you from behind. Come here. And then they walk in front and they're like, he really can't hear. I'm like, no, I really can't. What do you need? Um, 
And then I tell them just tap me and they'll be like, and the other teacher will model for them to go here, see, look, I can touch him. He doesn't fall apart now. What do you want? Um, so it's it's trying to get students to feel comfortable um, about things. As far as advocacy, last year I was I got my jury summons. Woohoo! Boy, was I excited to go for jury duty. So I go down there and they said, Is there any any reason that you would need any accommodation? I said, yeah, you know, I can't hear. They're like, well, how much can't you hear? I'm like, if I told you, you wouldn't understand anyway. So I said, I'd like to have carts. And they said, well, we're going to have to wait and put you in another jury pool to do this. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Remember, this is the pandemic, right? Carts not being used like crazy. They couldn't schedule one. So they went, you're dismissed. I'm like, I don't think you tried hard enough. Thank you so much for sharing, Mike. It, I recall that because of the pandemic, the demand for college services went up so much, right? Because of school, because of work. It's really frustrating that they tried to get an accommodation for you, but they couldn't. Yep. And I, I figured, you know, there, there would be 12 of us. If I need it, I'm sure there's somebody else in there that could benefit from it. They might not need it as much as I did, but they could still benefit from that. But never worked out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. I will now give the stage to Sophia. Hi, this is Sophia. I'm gonna share an experience that I had in high school. Similar to Jen, I grew up in a very small town. I would say maybe 2,000 people entirely in the town. And they didn't have a lot of knowledge, obviously, about people with disabilities, let alone hearing loss. So during my freshman year of high school, I had a sign language interpreter for all five of my classes. And I was a pretty shy person back then. I was always scared to approach the teacher or just people in general. I was really shy. And so I always felt like I could ask my interpreter for things instead of the teachers. And so I would say, oh, what did I miss? Or what's going on? Uh, and however, <laughs> the teacher perceived that wrong and said that I was relying on the interpreter too much. And similar to what Jen said in Jen's experience about people with hearing loss means that automatic, you know, I was, I needed, I had a, a learning disability. So they said that I did, which I, I didn't. And so I had an IEP and all of that. But so end of my freshman year, I joined a meeting with my, my interpreter, my parents, my teacher, everybody was there. And the teacher said, you know, we're thinking Sophia, relies too much on the interpreter. We think that she needs to learn how to be more independent and not rely on the interpreter for their information. And I was having the interpreter full time in my classes and they thought, oh, well, maybe we'll just provide the interpreter for like one or two classes. Because I lived in a small town, it was hard enough to find an interpreter. I mean, there was a long commute for that interpreter. I remember that. And they were like, well, I'm sorry, I can't afford to work two hours a day. I need a full-time job. So they had to layer off. And so I was a very, like I said, I, I did not advocate for myself back then. And I just kind of, I let it happen. And the beginning of my sophomore year, I kind of expected to have a new interpreter. So I remember the first day of school and I went into my classes. I didn't see anybody. I didn't see an interpreter there. I used to use microphone for the teacher, like an FM system. I, I had two accommodations, the interpreter plus the microphone. And so I was waiting for this interpreter to show up and the administrator pulled me aside and explained, sorry, we couldn't find an interpreter for you. You're gonna be by yourself for the remainder of the year. 
do you have any friends that could help you can sign for you, you know, and can, they'll be able to help you. They'll, they'll catch you up on what you missed. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and back then I, I, I could hear a lot more back then than I can now. Uh, but I was like, okay, I guess I'll try my best and try and hear as much as I can. But I struggled so much. I lost so much information. I just missed so much. And I was, and my friends would always forget to tell me what was going on, of course. And I almost flunked out of high school <laughs> because of it. So finally, my junior year, I signed up for college prep courses because I knew I wanted to go to college. And I I remember my counselor noticed that I was signing up for all these prep courses and she speaked up and said, I'm sorry, you've been failing other classes. You're not smart enough for these college prep classes. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I That was the moment I needed to advocate for myself because I knew that I was gonna be smart enough and I knew I could get in them. And so that whole year of my junior year, I it, it bothered me and it bothered the administration so much. And I kept saying, hey, I need an interpreter. Hey, I'm not kidding. I need an interpreter. I can't hear. And this is the reason I'm failing my classes is because you didn't give me an interpreter. And so I kept speaking up and supporting the need for my accommodation. And every single day, like I said, I went into the administration office and I said, did you find anybody? How about now? Did you find anybody? Anybody? How about now? I'm waiting. And it just bothered me so much. And so towards the end of my junior year, I finally got an interpreter two months before school was over, mind you. But again, I went to a very small town school and there was another, inter there was another deaf student in that school. They needed an interpreter, but they could only find one interpreter for the both of us basically. So we had to change my schedule to see which classes were more important for them and then which ones were more important for me. Like lectures were more important than gym class in their mind. And they're like, well, you don't need an interpreter for gym class. Well, you need an interpreter for history and math. So that happened, got the interpreter, we had to share them. But so that was my experience in high school. And that's when I started to become more aggressive and, and being able to advocate for myself was that moment. I, that is incredible, Sophia. I mean, I saw that Alicia Lane Outlaw posted a comment in the chat saying that, wow, you're persistent. And I completely agree with that. Thank you for sharing. And so we've heard from all of the panelists about their different like struggles and like advocacy for their own accessibility. And it's really diverse. It can be environmental, it can be people's attitudes, it can be like the structural barrier just with demand for captioning or accommodations. And I will now turn it over to Andrea to ask the next question to all of the panelists. Keenan, I think um, I think you have question number four as well. Oh, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> thank you. So our follow-up question is like a follow-up to our last question. So it is, how can employers, state agencies, organizations be a more welcoming, inclusive, and accommodating work workplace? And how can they help promote that? Our first panelist will be Sean. This is Sean. I think this is kind of a tough one because I, I don't know if I have a specific example other than it's been, 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 been just having an awareness. I don't think employers and other organizations truly understand the number of hard of hearing to deaf people there are right in front of them that they're working. Um, to give an example, you know, there's 850,000 veterans in the state of Minnesota. 
over 60% or above the age of 60. Um, and of that community, almost all have some level of hearing loss or more. That's, that's a huge number. And that's a tiny portion of the population. So if you extrapolate that, the awareness, if employers and organizations knew that they're usually dealing with somebody that has some type of hearing loss, it's probably more common than they know that some of the accommodations that we sometimes have to advocate for should just be commonplace. So like in my workplace, if we're having a meeting, you know, we just have captions on. I'm in a position where I can make that happen. But at the same time, like you shouldn't have to even ask. It should just be assuming that somebody probably doesn't have enough to maybe want to stand out and, you know, draw attention to themselves. I have no problem doing that, but someone else, I am more than willing to just say, hey, just have the abilities and know that you can do it and ask the question. And I think that's the one thing um, that would really help is just realizing there's there's more people than they know needs need assistance. Thank you so much, John. Next, we'll turn it over to Monique. Hi, this is Monique, and I don't think I'm muted this time. I agree with Sean. There are two words that kind of come to my mind, and they are awareness and willingness to act. And so to me, as I'm getting along, I'm to give a lot of presentation, and I thank you for Zoom because that has also totally changed my world. But anyway, I give a lot of presentations and I talk to a lot of employers and organizations and so on. And it is amazing how little is actually known about hearing loss in the workplace and even less about how it can be accommodated more easily nowadays than ever before. And so I think our panelists have already given some real good examples of how that can be done, you know, with Bluetooth, with the uh, apps like Teams and Zoom and texting and all of those things. But there is also very little awareness about the advances in new technology. But there is fear of actually being challenged, you know, on some of these things. And so many feel that if they don't say anything, that it will never come up. And people who are hard of hearing, and that's the one that the ones that I am particularly identifying with, are very much reluctant of uh, really coming out and asking questions and advocating. And so we rely oftentimes on companies and organizations having ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act Title III specialists that are involved with accommodation. But many of them know very little about hearing loss and even less about accommodation. And so two expressions, however, that come out of the ADA, they immediately come up with those. And that is undue hardship and reasonable accommodation. And so they are afraid of being, of being maybe challenged on these things and that they might be having to invest money and time and getting uh, challenged by other workers. And so there is a relative fear and they actually sort of just let it go. And so we have to find ways also to get out of that one on one or one case at a time sort of education in our um, in our workplaces and some panelists have talked to that that they actually you know sort of have to make their case like like one time like one situation at a time should we say and so how will we raise that awareness because people do not buy into anything and change things if they don't know that it exists and if they have no idea how to solve it but they don't know what hearing loss is actually all about and so maybe we have to get involved in making hearing loss a lot more mainstream in our general population, in our families even, and that translates then into the workplace. And so how do we raise that awareness? I, uh, I know that we have a pony in the race. I have really no, I'm out there every day working on this, but how we can do that as a group? I don't know. Webinars, podcasts, you know, go and, and uh, put on educational seminars for people so that we are getting into that where we are also involving our employers and then get them on our side. And so they are willing to change those policies and to make these places more acceptable. 
Tetsu Keenan, thank you so much, Monique. Well said. Next, we'll turn it over to Jen. Go ahead, Jen. Hi, this is Jen. Um, when I when I learned of this question and I began to jot down some notes with regard to things that employers or agencies or organizations can do, um, I felt like it really comes down. Um, yes, the organization needs to implement um, certain policies and um, um, and whatnot in order to allow for things like, you know, technology to be up to par and all this and that. But at the end of the day, if you don't educate the people that work for the company, um, your efforts are, are going to be lost. Um, you know, when I think about the company that I work for, we have a really wonderful business resource group that's dedicated to um, employees or, or, or just, you know, anyone across the country who wants to learn more about um, disabilities of various kinds, um, you know, we, but when you offer these things and you come up with wonderful, great education, seminars, trainings, lunch and learn things, but you don't give your employees the time to attend such things or enjoy such things, uh, they don't, they don't work. Um, so in a, in a huge company of, you know, 80,000 plus employees to attend a, a a business resource meeting on promoting an anti-ableist culture and only 200 people come, have you, and yes, you've impacted those 200 people, but the company itself isn't going to benefit as a whole from it. So um, I guess you, pro providing that education and providing your employees the time to um, take advantage of it is something for sure that I would say. Going back to the technology, again, I, I can't stress enough, hire IT folks and equipment people that can advise on what's available, that can provide and set up accessible equipment, that can um, do so without having to go through lengthy processes of applying for ADA accommodations that could take weeks to go through discussions and boards. It's just not necessary anymore. Let's just get on board with that type of thing. Um, be proactive when you have systems and platforms changing. Understand how that's going to affect the equipment that um, that your users have and, and, and what works for them. Um, if you're talking to someone about their needs and their accommodations, hear them, take notes, ask questions, um, document it because it's exhausting to repeat it over and over and over again. Um, and at the same time, when you do force someone to repeat it over and over again, and you do force somebody to go through lengthy hoops and application processes to get what they need, you create a feeling of separateness or isolation. Understand that it's a person. It's not, a, it's not just a disability that you're working with. You're working with a person um, and see them for that. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough, if you don't understand, ask. Thank you so much, Jen. We're changing interpreters at this time. Thank you. We will now go to Mark. Hi, this is Mark. Um, I come at this from a real different perspective. Um, I was the mental health counselor at the Ohio School for the Deaf for 14 years. So when I started teaching ASL, I took that style of interaction with me. So my classroom runs as if everybody and all the students were deaf. So when I hand out papers, I hand out and I wait till it goes all the way around the room before I start talking again. And students are like. So I try and model it that way. Um, students call me Mark because my sign name is M. If my sign name was M with a Z, they call me Mark Zangara. If my sign name was a Z, they call me Zangara. Well, it flips administration out because that's not high school culture. 
It's Mr. Zankar. No, it's not. If your teacher can be senorita, whomever, I can be Mark. So administration really didn't know what to do with me. I filled the role. I didn't quite fit in. Um, the phone rings. I have a student pick it up. You want me to answer? Yes. But I know. They know. They're calling here. You answer it. I can't hear on the phone. I can hear the voice, but it sounds like, whoa, 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 whoa. So that doesn't help. Or the office will send somebody down. So they've kind of accommodated for me just because that's how I've set the parameters. The thing that I like about this is I'm teaching students sign language and deaf culture. The idea that my most of my students are going to become sign language interpreters like Dee and Tara is ridiculous. Very, very few of my students will become sign language interpreters. Some of them will use sign language with their, with their profession. If they're a nurse or if they're, they work in the Ace Hardware store, something like that. Some of them won't remember a sign. But the most important thing is, this is where they're going to carry this deaf stuff. They're going to know that deaf people are equal to them. They're going to realize that there's a lot of deaf people who are a hell of a lot smarter than they are because they know two languages. So my whole thing is, how do I build the next generation of citizens to be deaf aware and deaf friendly and deaf accommodating and deaf inclusive. So I kind of have a, a, little, a little different role. I don't have to fight too much. Thank you so much for sharing, Mike. We'll now go to Sophia. Hi, this is Sophia. Well, since I'm last on the panel, I feel like everyone else has already said what I had wanted to say. But I will add to some of what they've talked about. I feel like they should prepare for me, my personal experiences, that mm, working in a factory, I started working there last year, I should say, and then, um, and then, I thought, well, maybe it would just be a short temporary job just to make some fast money for one summer. I didn't expect to continue working and I wasn't really expecting a lot of accommodations. Then I came for orientation. I wasn't expecting them to know what to do with a person who has a hearing loss. I came in and they'd already had notes ready to go, pencil paper for me microphone ready to go that that transcribed to captioning but they didn't even ask me anything but they were trying to help and I liked that and I felt that because they knew it right away that I was deaf and I told them that and they were trying to make preparations for me so I felt like they should have asked me and I could have told them what my communication preference was because but it was I already use my voice and I work alone at night. I don't really, you know, couldn't really think of anything at the time, but I did want to mention at another job that I used to work at. Um, it was a group home and I was hired as an assistant manager to work at the group home with other deaf clients. They are, are all completely deaf, had some mental illness, other disabilities. It seems like the people that were running that organization really didn't understand how important communication was, especially for deaf people. They were always placing people in there that had no idea about deafness, did not know deaf culture, American Sign Language, and that was hard because these clients have medicines that they need to know about and any communication about any pains they had or any place they wanted to go. People just placed 
into that home not knowing what's going on and not knowing how to communicate with them. I, I feel that wasn't fair and it made it seem like the people were there were not running that organization. We're not really learning more about the deaf community, especially those with other intellectual disabilities or living in group homes that have other support, de support needs more than typical needs. I feel like if in an environment, a deaf and hard of hearing support, deaf culture, knowledge, American Sign Language knowledge, whatever needed, they were able to help support those clients better with those that had hearing loss. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you so much, Sophia. We've heard from everybody just the importance of education, awareness, examples of inclusion, sometimes what exclusion looks like as well. Thank you everybody for sharing. We will now turn it over to Andrea for the, our final panelist question. All right, um, our last question I think is really going to blend into number four quite a bit. Um, and one common theme I'm sort of hearing is that there needs to be more awareness and education. Um, but the question is, what is one issue that you'd like to change for the future? So that could be anything from system-wide change to policy change to um, hiring procedures, anything like that. Um, you know, for example, would you recommend mandatory disability training for um, coworkers or anything like that? Um, so I will first ask Sean. Hi, this is Sean. Um, I really have three thoughts to this question. Um, two short ones and then my, my third little longer answer. Uh, first, it kind of goes back to what uh, Monique said about podcasts. If somebody can come up with an answer of why we don't provide transcripts or captions for podcasts, uh, that would be amazing. I don't know who could do that, but I, it's a rarity to find that. Two, um, one issue that I would challenge, I think employers, I work with uh, some of the largest employers um, through my work throughout the state of Minnesota. And most of them have some type of employee group for just about any type of either a veteran group or a knitting group, or, you know, I like cats group. Um, but to, to allow people to have, you know, a hard of hearing group, um, not because, you know, it's different, but it's, it allows the employers to have a set group that kind of creates a focus group for them. Um, and I don't think they even know that like that's something that they help help them with their own internal policies and and create other ways to um, really expand across their whole uh, organization. But lastly, my 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 biggest issue I think for for um, social and policy change uh, would go back to open captioning. Andrew and I have both been to uh, many theater events where you have open captioning, and that is life changing. Um, and, and in other settings that I've been to, I go to a lot of um, uh, government and political uh, engagements. And at those engagements, there tends to be crowds and it tends to be loud. And that's the worst thing for me. Um, the speaker could get lost in distortion. And I know that the last time we had an event similar to like, it was called Veterans Day on the Hill. Um, everybody could have, could have benefited from open captioning. And the technology is there at the Capitol. Um, and it's really just about learning about how to just have it, just turn it on so that the people have it and that the organizers don't even have to ask for it, that it's, it's available because there's there's an issue that every one of us wants to go to, whether it's Veterans Day on the Hill or Homeless Day on the Hill or GLBT uh, Day on the Hill or you name it. There is there's a day for you to go talk to your legislator and to be active in your community and to be active in your government. And you need to hear what they're saying and everybody needs to hear it. So I, I'm a big fan of, of having not just interpreters, but having that open caption going all the time. Thanks, Sean. I do think um, hard of hearing people are a little unique in that they don't always rely on an interpreter. So they don't always understand that captioning is even available at events like that. Um, so the next person I'll call on is Monique. 
Well, this is Monique. And if you're asking me, oh my, I would like to change everything, policy and accommodation and everything, because a girl can always dream, but that unfortunately is not reality. And so we should not have to fight to hear and to work effectively. And so I have always been a big believer in education and in advocacy on all levels. And I would like to see people with hearing loss, but especially also the hard of hearing, because deaf people are doing a much better job for themselves than the hard of hearing people actually do. I'd like to see hard of hearing people as of tonight become a lot more visible you know, to get involved, like, for instance, in the change in their work, like Jen just said, how are IT changes, for, in for instance, affecting you? Ask those questions as it goes on. And by asking, we also educate, because maybe changes can be tweaked to accommodate rather than later on when it's all done, it doesn't work, and then we have to backtrack. And so, but there is also a corollary to this because hearing loss does not only affect us at work, it also affects us in our, on our daily lives. And so we also need to get a stronger voice in our daily lives. And so we as, maybe as customers and as consumers, we can become educators and advocates at companies by asking for accommodation in their places you know, of business. Like, for instance, captioning has been mentioned for, for bars or for, you know, for entertainment places and wherever we go in podcasts to turn the music down, for instance. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a lot. But we can, in, in so many ways, educate as we go. And, but we have to get out there and we have to start doing it because it will not happen, you know, just by sort of osmosis. And, um, and so that's my final thought on this, you know, that we, the people with hearing loss, have a lot of power and we have to start exercising those powers through whatever channels we can have. I appreciate that, Monique. Um, next, I'll ask Jen. Hi, this is Jen. Um, in my notes list, captions, 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 everywhere, all the time, every screen, every event, every YouTube video, every training seminar, every, every, everything. Captions, they're necessary. Um, I'd like to see benefit coverage for hearing care being required um, at, at these different companies. Um, a lot of times you'll see maybe in the really small, really fine print, um, a lot of benefits will cover, you know, $1,000 in a year every other year. I don't know of a single hearing aid that is that cheap. So um, better hearing coverage for hearing health and equipment. Um, and again, just easier to find education on what is available um, from a technology perspective. Thank you, Jen. Those are all really good points. Um, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, this is Mark. Um, in our area of St. Paul, they're, they're doing curb cuts. Curb cuts. I was told, well, St. Paul's on the 10 year plan. So they're, they're renovating things. Actually, St. Paul's on the 36 year plan. This little unknown piece of legislation called the Americans with Disability Act was signed in 1990. And we're finally getting around to curb cuts. <laughs> really, I, I agree with Monique. If hard of hearing people get together, cause a stir. There is no reason that in the year 2022, that we should going, we should be going without anything. They've had 36 years to figure this stuff out. Nobody does anything unless you call them on it. And you need to be big and public and grossly over the top. So that you look ridiculous. And people go, maybe they mean something. Honestly, open captioning. I, okay, 
I get the whole sports thing. We don't want to cover up some important thing. Okay, the news. We can't caption the news. It's on every bar. I was sitting in the airport recently and I'm like, nobody understands what's going on that bloody thing. They don't have a clue. I'm a better lip reader than the guy sitting next to me. He's going, wow, open caption. It, it, it's not phenomenal. I, you know, I think um, Andrea Keenan, you just do a hard of hearing day to bitch about stuff. Just tell us where to show up. We'll show up in masses. We'll have signs. We'll go, your theater should do open captioning because it's the right thing. Not that it costs anything or it helps anybody. The poor hard of hearing people need help. No, because it's the right thing. Right. So Mark, I agree with you. And my follow on yes. question to that would be sort of how do we galvanize the hard of hearing community to, to do that, to have a voice? Because um, I feel like a lot of us are pretty quiet about our needs. You know, job, huh? you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I peruse Facebook from time to time. I don't, you know, I talk to my students, well, it's on Facebook and they go, oh, yes, it's for old people. We, we, you know, we just, you start with a small group, you get it out there and we just keep pulling people in. Okay. Andrew, you pull in the guy that's downstairs that you can hear. I'll pull in the gal that's sitting in the living room and then we'll all pull in our friends. And before you know it, we've got this big group and you don't stop until you get what you want. We're too much, well, I did it. It's too hard. They're not gonna do anything. No, no, you stand out there. I, I see people do it all the time. There's on Summit Avenue, somebody's always got a poster support this person, support that person. They're standing out there in the rain. And I'm like, good for you. You got some guts. Instead of, we only do it on nice days. It, it's, you just gotta get pissed off and you just gotta move forward because nobody's gonna give us anything. No disabled person has been given anything. They've had to earn it. The problem with our kids now is they're entitled. They didn't have to work for anything. My generation, the generations past have slaved to get this stuff done. They've suffered. Our kids now are like, I got a cell phone. I got this, I got that. I got everything I need. Didn't cost me anything. They didn't have to do anything but show up. You know, we, we just, we need to mobilize people like that. I'll be there, stay off their lawn. <laughs> Yeah, it was just down, delicious. They comment. cut down my tree. Thank you for sharing, Mark. I appreciate your perspective. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Sophia. Hi, this is Sophia. I would say the same thing that everyone else has said open captioning. I do want to share an experience that I had faced. It's not from in Minnesota. It's in, it was in London, England. I was in, um, on the subway, the tube, going to different places. One time I went to meet a friend at a bar and it's always loud. I can't always catch everything that's being said because it is so loud. So I was trying to stop one at one station on the tube so I could get off and get back on. And I didn't understand, maybe I missed the station. I got on, got off, got on and off. But I, at one point I was like, wait a minute, I'll just go to a different tube station. Finally, I met my friend and I was like, what? I don't understand why that happened to me. She said, oh, the loudspeaker said that station is close. And I said, well, I can't hear that. So I felt that with open captioning, with the announcements, announcements should have captioning as well on a screen 
so we know what's going on. Otherwise, we miss that information. It took me an hour to get together with my friend. It was just, it should have been an only a five minute ride to meet them. With sport, sporting events as well. The music, the stadium itself is always so loud. They always have announcements too, and I cannot hear or understand what's being said. I think the wild games, the hockey games, the wilds, when they play, when they're playing hockey, I have noticed they do have captioning on their screen. So that's a start. Movie theaters as well. We're talking about the captioning in the airport too that you were saying, yes, I agree with that, definitely. Because I fly a lot and I never really understand what's being said right in the middle of the flight or in the airport. Especially, I wouldn't know if it's important to, but it might be important to us if, especially, it, you know, there's something going on on the airplane. If there's some turbulence, I want to know. I don't want to be surprised. Again, so yes, that's what I wanted to share. I definitely agree, Sophia. Um, my family and I just flew um, last week and I had no idea what the pilot was saying. Um, and the one time I did note on my ticket that I was hard of hearing, I got a wheelchair. So um, I definitely agree with you and I understand. So thank you for sharing. Um, and it, I'm not sure if we have time for Q and A. Keenan, I'll let you um, take over. We only have five minutes left, so we do need to wrap this up. I want to thank you, everyone, for sharing the stories, all of our wonderful panelists. I want to thank everyone in the audience who came and listened to all of our stories. Justin will post a survey link. Um, please, please answer this. I know Mike made a comment about how, you know, we all need to show up. I'm asking the audience to please, please show up for all of us and fill out our survey. Um, we have a heart of hearing focus group. If you're interested, you can contact Andrea or I. We'll put our email addresses in the chat. Um, this is a focus group that works to just understand like some of the different community issues and it can result in bills that we love before. Um, we also provide hands-on training at the state capitol on legislative advocacy. This is really a chance to you know, get out mobilize, help teach others how to mobilize and advocate. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Um, I don't see the link, survey link, so I'll just go ahead and post that now. Please click on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dee. Thanks, Tara.